So hi, my name is Shannon, and I'm a sinner. Let's pray. Holy God, please forgive our sins, for they are many. Forgive us, for we have sinned against you. We have sinned against our neighbors. We have sinned against our pew mates. We have sinned against our family members, our friends, and strangers. And so we ask, have mercy on us. According to your loving kindness, exhibited most powerfully in Jesus on the cross, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And open to us now to, uh, open us now to both truth and grace, which we desperately need, which is like water for our lips, food for our stomachs, oxygen for our lungs. Fill us with your spirit or your breath. Help us to hear and receive and learn and grow. I pray that as my words are faithful to your word, that they may be received. If my words in any way are inconsistent with your word, may they be immediately and forever forgotten. We pray in the name and in the character of Jesus. Amen. So last Sunday was the first Sunday after Easter, the first Sunday after Resurrection Sunday. And last Sunday morning, we sort of began by reading the entire 28th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, the last chapter in uh, Matthew's gospel, where he, in that chapter, recounts three resurrection or post-resurrection uh, experiences or encounters, appearances of Jesus, the third of which happened to be, you may remember if you were here, uh, Jesus and his disciples up on a mountain. He said to them, uh, go to this mountain up in Galilee, the northern part of the Holy Land, and I will meet you there. The 11 remaining disciples went up uh, to uh, Galilee, up that probably a particular mountain, met Jesus there, and they have this conversation. He uh, shares with them his last words in Matthew's gospel and the last words in Matthew's gospel, words that have come to be known as Jesus or the Great Commission, uh, words that many of you are familiar with. Those, are gonna be this, those three verses are gonna be our focus this month. And so uh, to that end, uh, let me read those familiar words and listen closely, maybe because, and especially because, they are familiar. Uh, sometimes things that are familiar, we think we know. Uh, listen closely. This is the word of God. Then Jesus came to them, to his 11 disciples, and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, which we talked about last Sunday. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all I have commanded you. And surely I am with you all the days to the very end of the age. And last, that's 18 through 20. Last week we looked at verses 16 and 17, the two verses that come in before, before that, as kind of prelude to these verses. And then we focused most of our time on Jesus' assertion right there at the beginning of 18 that all authority in heaven and all over the earth has been given to him. And we've talked about what particularly authority was and is and what that meant especially for Jesus, that he possessed, that he had been given all authority. This morning we're gonna focus on two words in the Great Commission, the words nations and then the word go. To begin the Greek word in the original New Testament manuscripts, most often translated into English as nations, as in verse 19, is ethne, from which are derived several English words, which you can probably guess, ethnic, ethnicity, to name a couple. Those are words that immediately derive from this Greek word ethne, plural, nations. And some scholars have suggested that even though ethne in verse 19 has historically been translated in English versions of the Bible as nations, there may actually be more helpful ways of translating that word into English today. So the highly regarded Strong's exhaustive concordance is about that thick and just this huge tome and a classic resource in uh, understanding and biblical scholarship. Strong's exhaustive concordance of the Bible defines ethne, or the singular ethnos, as a race a tribe, a non-Jewish people, a pagan, Gentile, or non-Jewish people. Thayer's Greek lexicon of the New Testament, another highly regarded resource, defines ethnos as a tribe, a nation, a people group, 
and or a multitude of people simply living together. The contemporary Greek uh, scholar and prolific author William Muntz in his analytical lexicon of the New Testament, the Greek New Testament defines ethnos as Gentile, pagan, people, or nation. A lot of different ways of defining that word. And so while the word nations is a valid and in many ways accurate translation of the Greek word ethne, the context may lend itself to another broader or even different definition. One reason for this is that a person, when you think about it, and remember the Great Commission, that a person can't make a disciple out of a nation. A nation cannot be baptized. A nation cannot be taught to obey. People, however, can be made into disciples. People can be baptized. People can be taught to obey. Are you with me? Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, ethne. And so if the Greek word ethne does not have to mean foreign nations, foreign soil, foreign places, people living within the bounds of a nation far away, then all of a sudden Jesus' words and message can and maybe should be understood a little differently. So that now Jesus' message is not just about traveling to distant lands, but instead includes and maybe is primarily about connecting with people who are different than oneself right here or simply going to all, remember that was Matthew's favorite word in the Great Commission, it occurs four times, all peoples, all races, all tribes, all people groups, all of the people everywhere, regardless of whether or not they're like oneself or different, but starting right here, right outside the walls. So Jesus' so-called Great Commission certainly includes people who live in faraway places and deep in jungles and high up on mountains and back mountain roads and on remote little islands out in the Pacific. But Jesus' Great Commission also very much includes your next door neighbor, the person in the office next to yours, the people with whom you eat lunch at school, the people with whom you play pickleball or share other common interests, the most easily accessible people to you in the world. I think many Christians and people in Christ and much of the church decided a long time ago that the Great Commission is for a select group of people among us, a very small number, specifically called by God to foreign missions, and that Jesus' great commission does not apply to us. It does not apply to me. And yet nothing could be further from the truth. Instead of the mission field looking like this, or this, or this, I will show you what the mission field looks like. It looks like the people in your life. It looks like the people you work with. It looks like your community. It looks like your street. It looks like your apartment complex. It looks like Trader Joe's. It looks like Crunch Fitness. It looks like the country club or the golf club that you're a member of. It looks like 25th Avenue. That's what the mission field of the Great Commission looks like. And so again, this raises the question of what a modern Christian missionary looks like. And I will show you what such a person looks like. Are you ready? Turn to your right. And now turn to your left. And now look behind you. And now look in front of you. Put your right foot in, put your right foot out. No, but seriously. The people around you are what the modern Great Commission missionary people look like, period. That's it, that's who they are, not that fancy, not even that good looking. To you maybe. There are probably some of us in the sanctuary this morning who are still sorting out what they believe about Jesus, 
and the gospel and the kingdom. Maybe you're not convinced or maybe you're not convinced yet about who he was, what he was about. Maybe you don't feel like you know enough. Maybe you've got more questions than answers at this point. That's fine. But for the rest of us, we've got this big green light from the authoritative one. And I want to start calling Jesus that. He's the authoritative one. We've got this big green light from him that says, go. Go. You permission granted. No laws against it. In fact, you're supposed to, if the light goes from red to green and you just stay there, I was actually, that happened a couple of times, twice yesterday to me as I'm driving around. Uh, I was in the first position and someone else was in the other first position. Actually, I was second position one time and first position another time. The light turns green and you start hearing it from people. You're in line, you're on the road, the light's green, go. And unlike foreign missionaries who have to spend years praying, planning, raising support, and getting all all kinds of logistics lined up, tickets bought, vaccinations, paperwork, passports, visas, all of that taken care of before they head off to distant destinations, most of us are ready to go today, right now. Like your cars, those of you who have cars, have gas in them. Well, except for those of you who have electric cars, but you're (laughs) fully charged batteries sitting in the parking lot ready to go, green light. In the past, embracing the Great Commission looked like this, like just months, if not years, of packing your bags, of getting everything you're gonna need, of putting it all together. But today here in America, None of that's necessary. We're ready. You're ready. You're actually ready. You may not feel ready, but you're ready. And to us, uh, and so to us, just as Jesus said to his disciples up on the mountain, Jesus says, here today, go. To which most of us, most of the church, most Christians today in America respond, Jesus says, go, and we say, no, no. Instead of go, we may choose to stay. Where we're at, as we are stationary, unengaged with the so-called ethne, because we've convinced ourselves that they're a long way away on the other side of the world, airplane ride for 12 hours, another one for eight hours, then a 14-hour drive on a Range Rover through bumpy roads, and then walking on foot for another hour or two until you get to that little village. No, that's not the way it works anymore. Instead of go, we choose stay. Instead of go, we choose to wait until God provides just the right opportunity or someone, another, the other person uh, initiates or asks us a question. We'll be ready if that happens, but that so rarely happens. Instead of go, the church waits for people to come to them. Can you imagine Jesus? Okay, uh, resurrection, see you in Galilee, up on a mountain, Jesus is in the 11 disciples. They show up. He says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, therefore, wait right here. Wait right here up on the mountain and see if some people drift up the mountain and want to talk and ask you how to talk and ask you about conversations and ask you about what the gospel is and who's the Messiah and who was that Jesus. Can you imagine that? Like, what if the gospel of Matthew ends that way? Jesus, seeing Galilee up on a mountain, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, wait, and maybe some people will drift up here, find us up on the mountain. And if they do, then you can, you can sort of tell them and things like that. It's not the way it happened, not the way it was intended. And yet, that is largely the church's strategy and plan today. This is effectively the way that we hear and respond to Jesus' words today, or at least for much of the church. Jesus says, go, and then we do some spring cleaning like in the annual rhythm of the church. Put some flowers out, we prepare the coffee and snacks for when people come to us. And Jesus says, go, and we say, well, we'll pray. And praying's good and great. I mean, it's like, it's really good and great and important to pray, but it's generally not a substitute for going. How, has anyone ever sort of seen that, that in, the church we substitute praying for going. And that seems pretty spiritual. Jesus said go, we say, well, let's let's pray. Let's pray about that. 
Christian mission organizations estimate that there are thousands still of unreached people groups, UPGs, in the world today. And Jesus' Great Commission compels us to send people to those groups, to those ethne, absolutely. But doing so doesn't negate the fact that the world, the nations, the people, the tribes, the races, the ethne, are also now right in our backyard and next door. And they're us, actually. Our community is increasingly becoming an unreached people group in the sense that while people of our community may have heard Jesus' name, Jesus' name and the good news of his kingdom has been so badly distorted. I mean, I just almost can't bear to watch the news anymore or to read the news. The name of Jesus and who he was and his message and his purpose have been so terribly, horribly disfigured by the media, not throwing stones at the media, but it's just the way it goes, and by misinformation and by misunderstanding. Jesus' name truly maligned by those who have embraced his name as well, who have misunderstood his cross and misused his cross even in the public arena as well as our private arenas. That Jesus' name truly doesn't doesn't mean to people what it means in the scriptures. Who he was, what people think about, even those who have heard of Jesus don't know the Jesus of the scriptures because our world, we, the church, those outside the church have so badly maligned, misunderstood, and misused his name. So that we are surrounded by ethne who know almost nothing of the Jesus of the scriptures. But, Someone may reply, our world is so much different than the first century world in which Jesus and his disciples ministered, as if people were receptive to Jesus and his message then. Have you read the Gospels? Have you read how Jesus met resistance at every level of his ministry? Almost everywhere he went, by uh, almost every group of people, insiders, outsiders, Really kind of the only people that he didn't meet a lot of resistance from were the riffraff and the broken and the outcast. But everyone else, from disciples to Pharisees and everywhere in between, incredible resistance. It's true that we live in a somewhat post-Christian world, but Jesus and his disciples ministered in a pre-Christian world. They too experienced all sorts of, I'm not about to believe that. I can't, I won't. Today, disciples of Jesus, when confronted with Jesus, go explain, we don't want to be pushy. People don't want religion forced on them. And of course they don't. That's true. That's true. And I agree about that. Until they find themselves in some sort of existential crisis or wrestling with what is reality or is there good or is there a God, or what happens after I die, or what, what is there of a spirit world? Which are questions that people eventually come to at one point or another in their life, when they're in some sort of crisis, when they're really sort of being honest, when things sort of get, go really blank, when they're in the face of death, with the death of a loved one, or the sickness, or illness, or mortality. I have a friend who's, uh, leaving in a few weeks to go to Mongolia. And all of the Christian organizations and churches in Mongolia, I don't know if you sort of, Mongolia, uh, nobody, didn't get a lot of airtime, but up there above and to the west of China, huge uh, country uh, geography-wise. Uh, all of the Christian organizations and churches in this non-Christian country have uh, gotten together and agreed that we're gonna go to every home in Mongolia and every home and take a Bible and uh, take videos about Jesus in their language to show, to present, to hand off. And he's super excited about this. Um, and th this has been going on for uh, months now. It's like gonna be a year long project. And the deal is that in Mongolia, the culture says when someone comes to your door, you answer it and you invite them in regardless. And so like it's primed for people to kind of go and visit my friend to go, for, even from the United States, and go and visit native or non-native Mongolian. Yeah, come on in, have some tea, sit down, let's hang out, let's visit. Like that's the default hospitality of that culture. 
And so that's uh, going to be this really great um, enterprise this year. In contrast, uh, someone comes to our door, and we look through the people, <laughs> and then we decide if we're even going to let them know if we're home. Or we check our phone app from the other room, our doorbell app, and see who it is. Is that the Amazon guy, or is that the Jehovah's Witnesses, or some stranger, or solicitor? Different world. I get it. Um, during seminary, I uh, served as a chaplain one summer in a hospital, and I remember uh, lots of different encounters with patients, but one in particular. Uh, the door was mostly shut, cracked about six inches. I knocked on the door and said, and this is just sort of standard, dozens and dozens of times a day, uh, hello, it's the chaplain. And uh, the reply came quickly out of this room before I'd sort of moved the door open anymore. I don't want any, go away. Like, okay, there you go. Uh, right after we moved to California, uh, we moved into our house, and uh, a few days later, met the next door neighbor. His name is Jahan. Uh, he was putting out his trash. I was putting out his trash. I wasn't putting out his trash. I was putting out our trash. And uh, I said, hi, hi, my name's Shannon. I just, just moved in, pretty obvious. Uh, what's your name? My name's Shannon. Okay. Uh, what do you do for a living, Jahan? I'm an um, industrial engineer. Oh, it's great. What do you do for a living? I'm a pastor. And quote, I'll never forget this. His response was, what a cheesy job. <laughs> okay, welcome to California. I get it. So I get it. So I get that, like, there's this level of resistance or walls or I'm not interested in our culture. But can we trust the authoritative one? The one to whom authority in heaven and earth has been, has been given. Can we trust that he knows what is best and good and what's possible and what's important and what's urgent? All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, wait, stay, pray. No, go, go, go. Admittedly, also, uh, things can look a little bit different in our world today. Uh, the world is different than it was 2,000 years ago. Uh, literally, with my phone, I could this morning from the platform ring up, if I had their, their numbers, like six or seven billion different people. We have access to the world in a variety of different ways, and so there are different ways using technology and transportation that weren't available in Jesus' day to go but nevertheless, whether it's through technology or in person to the people immediately around us, when Jesus says go, the light's green, go. And still some of us will say, I don't know what to say, to which I would suggest four things in closing. To the person who sincerely is interested, these four things who say it, to the people who say, I, I don't know what to say, one, tell your story. Just tell your story. This is my experience. This is my experience of Jesus. This is what I know of him. This is what I've known to him. This is how I've encountered him. This is how maybe my life is different in some small or big way because of my knowledge and friendship and following Jesus. That's pretty easy. Just tell your story. People like to hear other people's stories. Number two, tell people that God loves them. But along the way, also show people that God loves them. Don't just tell people that God loves them, but show people that God loves them through your life, through your actions, through the way that you're a neighbor to them. Show people, that, tell people and show, and definitely show people that people don't know how much you care, care how much you know until, you, until they know how much you care. I'll try that one more time. People don't care how much you know or what you know until they know how much you care. Yeah, okay, that's number two. And number three is be curious with people. Just be curious with people. Some of us think we feel quite insecure when we don't have all the answers. But Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God. Keep seeking, keep seeking. Be curious with people. You don't know the answer to that question? Are you, you're curious about that? I'm actually curious about that too. 
I don't, I don't really have a good grasp on a good answer for that question of yours. Can we explore that together? Would you be willing to look into that with me and I'll go learn some things and you go learn some things and we'll get back together and kind of compare notes and listen and see? Because I'd actually like to know about that too. Be curious with people. And then number four and finally, how about join a, a cohort? Like, let's say a six-week cohort. We'll call it a gohort. In which uh, you with another group of people commit to exploring what it looks like in our world for you and me to go to ethne around us, different peoples, tribes, nations, races, people who are just different than us everywhere, all around us. What does it look like to go to them in Jesus' name? And to explore that, to listen about that, to read about that, to pray about that, to commit to doing that, to be a, a part of a small cohort or gohort where you commit to trying and maybe failing sometimes, but that's okay. And then come back and learn and encourage and study and pray and then go again and again and again. So, tell your story. Tell people and show people that God loves them. Be curious with people and then join a cohort. cohort. Okay, so uh, I'm almost done. In front of you in the pew rack is a white card, a little white card, blank card. Just grab that real quick. And then I don't want to be manipulative here, but now that you're holding it, if you're interested in being in a cohort, and I'm not suggesting that you are or that you have to be, write your name on that and your contact information, whatever contact information, and drop it in the box on the way out. Now, if you're not interested, have no interest at all at being in a cohort and are offended that someone would ask you or encourage you to do that and even to grab the white card, then after when we're singing this song that Ben's gonna lead us in on the way out, just quietly slip the white card back in the, in the <laughs> and that's okay, that's okay. That's okay, but you got it in your hand for starters, so you know where it's at, you know how to do that. If you're interested, if you have the space in your life and you wanna do that, do it. If not, just like, don't take the card home and toss it, because we cut all those. And, let me pray. Let me pray. God in Christ, you are the authoritative one. You made this whole thing. You know it. You know us. You created the world from dust, from nothing. As someone said recently, nothing is your favorite material to work from in creating. And out of nothing, you made beauty. And you made things that would bring you glory and you made a world that you loved and admired and declared to be good and then very good. And then you loved humanity and put love within our hearts. We ask that you would uh, lead us in participating in your kingdom and your continual redemption of your creation, which you love. Lead us, guide us, fill us with your spirit, give us courage, we need courage. We are too often timid. Help us, and in that helping, bring uh, to your people joy and bring to yourself glory. We pray in the name of Jesus, amen.